Hi everybody, welcome to week two of PA8050. So, as I announced last week with my video, I, I said that each week I, I would present uh, a lecture on PowerPoint. And I also uh, record it as a video because it's a lot easier for you to open up from your home computer. Um, so I, I record a lecture on PowerPoint. I provide two copies to you. One is the, the video copy, the other is the PowerPoint copy without narration. And the reason I do that is so that you can, if you want to dwell on a particular slide uh, or even copy the PowerPoint slide uh, to save as a reference, you don't want to just lift it, but, but copy it to save as a reference, I'm fine with that. That's why I give you two copies of it. So what I wanted to talk about this week after the intro, after we looked at some actual public administrators you know through the the video series that was produced right here at UNO I I want to talk about this idea of what is public administration so I'm gonna frame this discussion through the lens of public employment and also I want to frame it through the lens of I would say uh, government involvement in the economy that's really how i want to frame public administration and its history in the united states so public employment and government involvement in the economy so let me get to that this lecture is probably going to take about 45 minutes or so so plan accordingly i had to go back there i had to go back because i skipped a slide so your book from Guy and Ellie has uh, in the in chapter one, they provide you with this long list of of events, really constitutional and law events that have happened in the context of running a constitution. So if you read um, Wilson or part at least part of the Wilson piece, you see that. The term running a constitution is is a term that became associated with with that work that Wilson wrote in 1887 when he said that it's getting harder to run a constitution than to frame one. Um, so Wilson's contention really was and we're going to talk more about this in next week's lecture. Wilson's contention really was that when the constitution was written in 1787 and ratified in 1788 the first constitutional era government of the united states really stood up in 1789 with the first congress and george washington elected president he, he said that the founders really focused a lot on framing the constitution they didn't think about running it and what he meant was they didn't think much about administration well so in fact, over the last 240 years or so, we, 230 years, we have been running the constitution. And that's what Guy and Ellie are getting at with this timeline that's in the book. And they talk about each one of these events separately. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on these, but again, they're on the PowerPoint version of, the, of this. And you should go back and look at each of these things uh, as an important event. And this is this this is the second slide of this. But the important thing, what I w I want you to remember is, you know, events don't happen out of the blue. There's some context associated with events. And what is that context? That's really the question we want to answer. So here's the third slide of this. And what I'm going to do now is I want to move into the context really of what do we mean by public administration? And how did modern public administration in the United States evolve within the context of the history of our republic? Okay, so Don Kettle, who wrote a book, he's written a lot of books, um, but he wrote this book called um, The Politics of the Administrative Process. And he said that uh, analysts and scholars have never agreed on a common definition of public administration. Um, so there is such a thing as private administration. We have a College of Business Administration at UNO, for example. Uh, 
Um, and really, that's about the administration of business. Um, but what is public versus private administration? Well, really, what public administrators do is the public's business, right? Um, and we could say that public administrators often use fundamentally different processes um, from business administration, but sometimes they're, they're really similar. Um, but still, we have a difficult time drawing sharp distinctions between sectors. So there are about five or six things here that really distinguish public administration from what I would call private administration. Um, so the first is public authority, and that is the recognition that, in fact, government is not a business. So it's very popular for people running for different elective offices uh, to say, I want to run government like a business. Well, I think what they mean by that is that they, they stress the value of efficiency, which is you get the most amount of output for every dollar of input. So if you can, if you have 96% efficiency, that means that you get 96 cents of output for every dollar of input, which would be phenomenal. Uh, it would be phenomenal for a business. But in fact, the authority for government is a public authority. That means the authority for government to even exist comes from the people writ large. Um, so when the constitution started with the preamble and said, we the people, that's actually, in a legal sense, establishing an authority. Um, so the second part is public legitimacy. So whether or not uh, people who work in government are, are actually efficient or effective, whether they're ambitious, whether they're lazy, whether they have integrity or not, they actually have some kind of legal legitimacy. Now, the problem with legitimacy is legitimacy has a legal sense and legitimacy has what I would call an affective sense, right? How you feel about something. So one could say that a particular elected official is not legitimate. Uh, and that would be in your view, your assessment of that elected official. But in the legal sense, that elected official, if that elected official was elected through the constitutional or the charter process, if you're talking about a city, um, that elected official does have legitimacy. So legitimacy is one of those tricky words, but public legitimacy is a part of public the public sector. Um, the third thing is public value. Um, I refer to an author named Mark Moore, 1995. Uh, he wrote a book, very famous book called Creating Public Value. Um, it's part of what we call the public management literature. And what his contention is, is that managers in the public sector have to create value. So he contrasts that with corporate value. So in the corporate world, value is determined by shareholder value, for example. In the public sector, it's a bit more amorphous. Um, the point that Moore makes is that the public sector, and you could you could tran translate this to the nonprofit sector, we deliver something of value to the public. And that in itself is kind of grounded in those two things I talked about earlier, authority and legitimacy. And then fourth, there is a public mission. So that means that an or a public organization doesn't exist to perpetuate its own existence. Now, there have been a lot of scholars that have argued that indeed uh, agencies, especially at the national government or the federal government level, in fact, uh, do seek to simply continue their existence. That's actually a pretty good argument um, in a lot of cases. But in fact, there is a public mission whereby that agency is delivering something to the public on behalf of the public uh, that has value. And then finally, there's this public service motivation, right? So this kind of gets trickier. So we're all altruistic, right? So the classic example is you go for a job interview um, why do you want to work for my nonprofit and your your first answer is well I want to help people well okay we all want to help people actually maybe some people don't um, you know maybe someone would go in and say really I I'm applying for this job because I dislike people and I want a job that I helps me avoid them as much as possible but a lot of people 
you know, say, well, I want to help people. Well, that's a public service motivation in a sense. Um, but it's hard to contrast that with the private sector necessarily because I would argue there are people in the private sector who have uh, a public service motivation. That's my opinion. I do apologize, I keep doing that. Nonprofits are there to meet the unfilled needs that often exist between public and private because neither the public or private are filling a need. Um, can you think of examples of that? There probably are many uh, in healthcare. Uh, there are many in education. There are many in other places. Um, so for example, uh, a history museum exists really to educate people in history. So one could say, well, why don't the schools educate people in history? Well, they do, but do they do that fully? No. Um, so a, a history museum exists really to educate the public at large in history. And it might be a very well a nonprofit that has that as a mission. It's filling a gap. Okay, so let me take one more value because it's important here. Go down to the value of equity. Look at the value of equity. So do businesses treat everyone the same? And so you can argue the answer to that is no. What a business does typically is it discriminates by price. That is in a pure market, a business always discriminates by price point. Now, now you have to argue whether or not that's in the best interest of the business However, that is in fact what happens. So for example, um, if you take apartments, you can go around a typical city, a large city, um, and you can see a lot of different price points for apartments. Um, so for example, in Omaha, the, the apartments in uh, the Exarban Village area uh, near the UNO campus happen to be some very pricey apartments. So what, what they're really doing is they're discriminating. Um, they're discriminating on the basis of price, right? Now, they would say, "Well, we offer a much higher level of uh, apartment experience than you would get at other apartments," and that's probably the truth. But it is a form of discrimination. So, look, just to hold that in abeyance for now, and I'll I'll come back to it. On the public sector, slide all the way over on that value of equity. In the public sector, we are legally bound to deliver equitable service, right? Does that mean equity always occurs? Probably not. So, um, for example, we are legally bound, if a person meets the requirements to get a driver's license, to issue that driver's license subject to the law. Now, is there discrimination in issuing the issuance of driver's licenses. Well, there shouldn't be um, by law. And if an administrator is discriminating, say on the basis of gender or age or race, they're breaking the law. So we, we set up laws and policy actually to prevent discrimination. However, that doesn't always mean that it is prevented. So for example, the Civil War ended in 1865. Um, the so-called Civil War Amendments, which would be the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, really addressed the inequities that had been levied upon African Americans for hundreds of years. Um, so citizenship was granted to African Americans via the 13th Amendment. Uh, equal protection under the law was granted via the 14th Amendment. And the right to vote was granted via the 15th Amendment. However, after uh, Reconstruction ended in the South in the 1870s, um, Southern states took it upon themselves to to set up legal boundary or legal restrictions against African Americans to actually vote, um, and these restrictions were actually carried out by public administrators. So the idea of poll taxes, the idea of uh, voting tests, these kinds of things were set up really simply to discriminate against African Americans at getting the vote. Well, that was the the impetus really for the Voting Rights Act of 
1965, so that's a full hundred years after the end of the Civil War, um, before there was a federal law that said that African Americans have the full right to vote just like a white American. Now, the fact of the matter is we still are arguing about the right to vote. And we, we still are having discussions about whether our voting systems are equitable or not. Um, so the point is that in the public sector, we actually are legally bound, legally bound to practice equity. That doesn't necessarily mean that it always occurs. So in the, in the nonprofit sector, we are really interested in equity in the delivery of service specifically to client populations. However, again, does this mean that equity always occurs? I would argue that it doesn't um, always occur in the nonprofit sector. So, um, so the question that you have to ask is, are our values aspirational or do we actually do a pretty good job of carrying out our values? I, I would actually say they're ideal and they're aspirational and these are things we should shoot for. So, okay, so what do we mean really by public administration? Um, so here's where, as a student of public administration, um, this is your first course. This is, this is something that you ought to be taking home with you, um, and, and sticking in your head as a student of public administration. So here's what people say in our public discourse. They say, well, the government is inefficient, or the government wants me to turn in this form, or the government charged me taxes. Well, okay, so the first question I would ask is which government? There are about 80,000 entities in the United States that can legally call themselves governments, okay? We'll get to more of that in a minute. But what are public administrators? Are public administrators, are public managers, public servants, we are the people that carry out government. Wilson said public administration is, is government in, in action, right? So you might not like paying income tax, okay? The, the law, the, the income tax rates are set by Congress. Um, so income tax rates are set by Congress, but the IRS, the Internal Revenue Service, actually administers the collection of taxes. People get angry at the IRS. The IRS, are really the people uh, actuating that law. So public administration implements law as established by government broadly. And then we have this idea of governance. So what do we mean by governance? Really, governance means that we're all running this nation or this entity, this city, this school district together. So that includes citizen involvement. It includes all the branches of government. It includes collaboration with other governments it includes the public, the private, and the nonprofit sectors. I would also argue that it includes our public discourse, which includes the media. So the idea of governance is that we are all governing together. So we all kind of have issues with government, right? Um, as public administrators, it's really important for us to at least understand the size and scope of government. So as a starting point, let me just say what I was referring to on that previous slide, that simply complaining about government is imprecise. Um, so, you know, in the middle school model that we all learned in grade school or middle school or somewhere along the line is that we have a federalist system with a national, sometimes called the federal government, and we have state governments, right? That, that is really what the constitution says. We have a national government, we have state governments. Because interestingly, cities aren't mentioned at all in the Constitution. But when, when, when we say we have three levels of government, we usually say national, state, and local. Um, so this simplistic model holds that each level of government has, has distinct authorities and responsibilities, but even that is imprecise because they're not necessarily that distinct. They, they run over each other. 
And the second point I want to make here is that there are many myths about government in the United States that we have to dispel as a starting point in this course. And I, 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 would, I guess I would just say in your MPA degree or your certificate degree or whatever degree you're getting. And here's the myths I want to talk about. Uh, the first myth is that government was basically laissez-faire until the New Deal of 1933 or after. Well, in fact, the national government got a heck of a lot bigger after the New Deal, but it wasn't completely laissez-faire uh, up to the New Deal. Um, we have this myth that the national government is the largest. It is in the sense of budgets. It's certainly not the sense in, the, in terms of the number of people working for that level of government. Um, we have the myth that the national government is big compared to those of other nations. Really, it's not. Um, and we have the myth that local government equals small government. It doesn't always. Some local governments are actually quite large and costly, um, and some might be ineffective. Um, and that the national government is, is super intrusive in areas like education. The national government is intrusive in a lot of areas. Um, we just seem to have this myth that the national government is intrusive in all areas. It's not. So let me cover this first point, that that the so-called big government involvement actually didn't start with the New Deal. It started much earlier. Um, I start with the Homestead Act. I can, you could actually go back uh, and realize that some public-private partnerships like canals uh, were were really happening in just the immediate post-constitutional era. I start with the Homestead Act because it seems like a convenient place to start right in the middle of the Civil War. Um, so the Civil War itself was this watershed event in American history that changed so many things, right? Like I alluded to earlier, post-Civil War um, gave theoretically gave rights to former slaves, to African Americans. Uh, but in fact, we know that those rights really weren't, uh, weren't fully granted and that many state governments found ways actually to abrogate those rights through so-called Jim Crow laws. And, and so really, um, you know, the equality between uh, white Americans and African Americans, you know, you can argue that it's never been realized. But it certainly wasn't realized for at least 100 years after the Civil War because states found ways, legal ways, of abrogating the, the actual amendments that were put in place to the Constitution. But let me go back to the Homestead Act, which occurred uh, as part of the Civil War, in a sense, and the Land Grant Act of also of 1862. So um, the Homestead Act, uh, my ancestors are homesteaders. A lot of people's ancestors are homesteaders. In the United States. The Homestead Act actually was a public-private partnership. What it did was it gave away land that was owned by the national government in the territories um, and said, hey look, if you show up and you provide labor on this land for five years and you improve it, this 160 acres is yours. So 160 acres in 1862 was actually uh, quite a little bit of land to farm considering that it was animal husbandry. Uh, you know, you're pulling an iron plow behind a draft animal. Um, so that actually settled the West, effectively, um, for at least for the European settlers um, and white Americans who were moving West. Um, so what it did was it established a cooperative relationship between farmers, states, and the federal government. Because the Department of Agriculture, one of the first departments beyond um, the Army, the Navy, and the Post Office, was also established in 1862. The Department of Agriculture is interesting because what it was really established for was to promote American agriculture. So just giving this family 160 acres was a great thing, but the Department of Agriculture was really put in place to keep those farmers on that 160 acres and to help them and to promote their business. The Land Grant Act is, a, is kind of a corollary act with the Homestead Act of 1862. What that did was, again, the federal government owned the property. It granted 30,000 acres that, that Congress, that the federal government owned, 
to the states to establish what were called land-grant universities. So the University of Nebraska system, UNL, the flagship campus, was a, was a land-grant university, which these were created to actually specialize in the science and art of agriculture. So you've heard of the Extension Service, which operates through the USDA. That's actually a, a cooperative uh, arrangement through land-grant universities and the USDA. So there's still an Extension Service in Nebraska, in every county. There are UNL scholars who contribute articles and expertise to the Extension Service. That was all part of the Land Grant Act. Um, it also established what are called Reserve Officer Training Corps. So if you've heard of ROTC, where military officers are trained, that was actually part of the Land Grant Act. Later, an 1890 amendment funded colleges to educate Blacks and Native Americans. So many of the historic black colleges and universities um, were part of this 1890 amendment. The Pacific Railway Act of 1862. So 1862 is a big year. Um, the Pacific Railway Act of 1862 actually established what is called the middle route for the Transcontinental Railroad. So basically from Council Bluffs, Iowa, effectively Omaha, Nebraska to uh, California. And so what happened there? The federal government guaranteed the, the, the bonds, that is guaranteed the debt incurred by the Central Pacific Railroad in California, um, as well as a newly established business, the Union Pacific Railroad uh, of Nebraska that started building the railroad west. Well, the Union Pacific is a Fortune 500 company. Most of you know that. It wouldn't have existed without the Pacific Railway Act. Um, so this public-private partnership actually built the Transcontinental Railroad. Were there government people out building the rails? No. As a matter of fact, there weren't. Um, it was these two railroads, but they were fully backed by the federal government. The Interstate Commerce Act of 1887 was the first regulatory commission in uh, United States government. It actually, uh, it actually came up to regulate railroads because it was really what we found was two two things that the government promoted ended up being in competition with each other so agriculture and railways ended up really hurting each other railways were charging prohibitive prices for for hauling farmers produce and farmers were up in arms so the interstate commerce act actually regulated freight rates the civil service act of 1883 is important because that is what Wilson was writing in light of. The Civil Service Act actually did away at the federal level with what was called the spoils system, whereby every time a presidential administration came into office, thousands and thousands of uh, office holders at every level were replaced by loyalists to the new president. The Civil Service Reform Act uh, sought to establish a merit-based civil service. So, so the idea that that you know government involved in the economy is relatively recent is is somewhat of a myth. It, it did get bigger. So let me tackle this idea of the size, relative size of government employment. This chart actually compares uh, the share of the workforce government employment as a share of the, the entire workforce in that country by percent to all these um, OECD countries, um, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. So a lot of uh, countries on that chart, the United States ends up being right in the middle with about 15% government employment as a share of the workforce. Not necessarily small, but, but nowhere near many of the European countries, which have a much larger percentage of its population as a share of the workforce. Um, the myth that um, that the federal government spent a lot more in states over time isn't a myth, in fact. Um, and this is one where we can really point to um, federal involvement in states that did grow after the New Deal, and in fact grew a lot more after the Johnson administration's Great Society programs were implemented in 1965, thereabouts. Um, 
so really the bottom line is health programs so think of medicare and medicaid um, and other programs, those grew tremendously after 1965 to the point where now um, a very large share of each state's budget is Medicaid um, and the federal dollars they're getting from Medicaid. So in fact, what has happened post New Deal, but especially post World War II, is that um, the federal government has created a relationship with states that is based um, a lot in grant dollars so those of you who are working in emergency management actually know that as well that a lot of the uh, relationship and a lot of the equipment that emergency management agencies get are from federal grants but so so federal aid to states has grown um, tremendously since the end of world war ii but uh, the relative size of the federal workforce really hasn't increased over time. In fact, it's it's probably gone down. So in relation to the number of employees to the population, the federal workforce really has not increased tremendously. Now, what this masks is the number of contractors who do work for the federal government. That's kind of a different subject, but it's related. Um, but the fact of the matter is, uh, people who say the federal workforce continues to grow, they're actually wrong because the federal workforce simply hasn't gr grown that much since the 1970s. Um, so this chart demonstrates that a little better. The blue line at the bottom is the the federal workforce. So really, it's, it's stayed relatively flat. Um, again, that might mask the involvement of, of contract employees. Um, what's, what's increased, however, is the number of state and local employees. Now, many of those employees actually are involved in public education. Um, so that is where the growth has occurred in terms of government employment at the state and local levels. So this is another one where, uh, you might want to go back to the PowerPoint slide and study this more, um, study this more intensely the point is that we have a lot of governments in the united states um, we have of course the federal government we have state governments and we have local governments you notice that the number of local governments from 1952 to 2012 has gone down um, that is due primarily to consolidations of a lot of local governments so then look at the types of local governments this is where we have a lot of governments. We have county governments. We've always had around 3,000 counties uh, for a long time since we've had 50 states. Um, then we have municipal governments, townships and towns, uh, school districts and special districts. So school districts, look at that line, the fourth line down. Those have decreased, again, primarily through consolidations and closures of school districts. Um, then special districts are an interesting subject in public administration. Special districts are things like water districts, um, library districts. Uh, in Nebraska, we have something called a sanitary improvement district, which is an unincorporated subdivision. Um, and all of these special districts have the power to levy taxes. So a great thought experiment sometime is if you're a homeowner, um, look at the property tax assessment that you get once a month from your county and look at all the tax levying entities that are listed on that statement. You might see some, you don't even know what they are. Many of those are special districts that have the authority to levy property taxes. So the point is, we have a lot of governments in the United States. We have something like 17,000 police jurisdictions, for example. So federalism really has wrought a lot of governments. Uh, Government is not this monolithic entity that controls everything. And that's the takeaway from this slide. So this slide purports to tell you really um, what the concentration of government spending is by level of government. So if you took spending and you just put categories of spending in little envelopes, you would see that this is where levels of government have 
primarily spent their money. Now, some of this has changed over time, but um, but really what we see at the federal level, the, the, the chunk of federal spending is in actually this isn't in order. So defense isn't the most costly thing. Really the most costly thing at the federal level are is healthcare and social security. So healthcare is Medicare and Medicaid. Um, social security is also very expensive, but between social security and healthcare and defense, that's about 78% or 80% of the budget, somewhere in that neighborhood. Um, it's gone up. It's, you know, been around two thirds, but um, so, when people talk about reducing the size of the deficit, for example, at the federal level, um, it's somewhat disingenuous when you start talking about things like, well, let's let's defund the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Okay, but that's not going to take very much out of the budget. Or people say, well, let's let's quit giving uh, out so much foreign aid. But foreign aid is only about one percent of the budget. So really, the the big spenders are defense, social security, and healthcare. Um, but if you look at this functionally, um, this is how these are the things the federal government are interested there in the left column. The column under state, uh, the things that state governments are interested in, if we take budget shares as an indicator of interest then states are interested in K-12 education. Uh, states are interested in higher education, in welfare, uh, highways, corrections, inspections, liquor stores, those kinds of things. Um, but really, uh, where the where most state budgets are, are really consume most, most of their revenue are in healthcare, that is the state share of Medicaid, and education. So whether that's higher education or the state share of K-12 education. What do local governments concern themselves with? Well, elementary education. Um, that gets a little confusing because we say local, but what we're really talking about for a lot of states, including Nebraska, is special districts and local governments. So there is an entity called the Lincoln Public Schools. There's an entity called the Omaha Public Schools. Neither of those entities have anything really to do with the city governments of Lincoln or Omaha. Um, Nebraska is like a lot of states where the school districts are independent from local governments. So there is a local government that charges property taxes. There is a school district that charges property taxes. They're distinct entities. Um, but local governments also spend on things like libraries, police, fire, parks, housing and community development. A lot of the local government uh, cost share is in public safety, so fire and police. Um, and then some mixed responsibilities like health and hospitals. But this chart really tries to depict the primary areas of spending and you can see spending by all levels in most of these areas mixing across the board. Um, another myth that that I think people hold is that the federal government, especially when it delivers services and goods, it does through it does it through the mechanism of this vertical, you know, pyramid shaped bureaucracy. In fact, that's not actually the, the truth necessarily. Uh, this guy named Lester Salomon did a study and his study was in I believe the year 1999 and he took all federal spending for 1999 and he put it in this book called The Tools of Government. So what he found and you can see it on this chart is that direct government that is that the government actually doing the work of service delivery accounts for about 28 percent of the spending of the federal government in 1999. Indirect government accounts for more. So what is indirect government? Well, for example, um, there are a lot of government contractors working for government. That's indirect. There are a lot of grants that are part of the federal budget. There are vouchers that are part of the federal government. There are tax expenditures. So what's a tax expenditure? A tax expenditure is that uh, a taxpayer gets an exemption uh, on income that they w otherwise would pay income tax on. So the homeowner tax exemption, 
which <laughs> is changing a little bit due to, due to the tax reform law. But, um, you know, previously uh, a homeowner could deduct the, the expense of interest from their income and the expense of local taxes from their income. So for a lot of middle class homeowners, that meant they were deducting, you know, somewhere between $5,000 and $15,000 a year off their income to for these kinds of tax expenditures. And then there are things like loan guarantees. Loan guarantees are a, a very large part of the business that um, the federal government does. Um, most mortgage loans in the United States are backed by some government agency like the Federal Housing Authority or the Veterans Administration. Um, most student loans are actually loan guarantees. A commercial bank might be making the loan, but there is often a loan guarantee from the federal government. So the point is that the federal government, when it does its work, isn't always directly delivering the service itself. Okay, so let me kind of switch gears a little bit here and talk about public administration as a field and as a study of practice. Uh, you know, it's a field of study and it's a practice. So this kind of gets us into the Wilson and Goodnow readings. And so let me say right at this point, the 41 minute mark of the lecture, um, what I want to talk about here uh, in terms of Wilson and Goodnow is that I'm giving you really two weeks to read these. Um, next week, I'm going to ask more discussion questions on Wilson and Goodnow. Uh, this week, I've asked you to consider um, something from the the guy in LA text. Um, so Wilson and Goodnow. So it's important to understand Wilson and Goodnow in context. And that context is that we often think of these two individuals as the, the fathers of modern American public administration. Because both of them really talked about this thing we call the politics administration dichotomy. So this might be the first time you're encountering that term. Um, but this is a term of importance in public administration. So what do we mean when we say politics administration dichotomy? What we really mean is that government consists of politics and administration, but that there is a wall of separation between them and they don't mix. Well, the question is, is that is that actually accurate? Wilson said administrative questions are not political questions. Although politics sets the task for administration, it should not be suffered to manipulate its offices. So what he meant to say is that politicians, elected leaders made policy and administrators carried it out. Um, he said that it is the clearing, it is clearing the moral atmosphere of official life by establishing the sanctity of public offices of public trust. And by making the service unpartisan, it is opening the way to make it more businesslike. So, okay, so what was Wilson talking about? Wilson wrote in 1887, four years after the Pendleton Act or the Civil Service Reform Act of 1883. What he was saying was that there should be something akin to an administrative core, C-O-R-P-S, an administrative core that carries out the business of government no matter who is in office. Under the spoils system, the term that was invented by President Andrew Jackson, under the spoils system, every single president basically fired every government official that worked for the federal government who, who was under the previous administration and hired new people every four years. Because Andrew Jackson's view was the only real qualification for working in government was loyalty to the president. And that tradition was carried on um, at least until 1883. There are still offices in the federal government, in the state government, and local governments that are at will employees that are political appointees. However, that is not the majority of federal employees or state employees or local employees. So what Wilson believed was that you could actually make administration business-like by having competent people 
business minded people in government who carried out the policy that politicians came up with without bias, without partisan uh, feelings, and they would do this efficiently. So the question is, is that really a reality? And we're going to talk about whether that's a reality as we move along through the course. So Goodnow said this very much the same thing. He said there's a large part of administration that is unconnected with politics. Um, and that should be free from the control of political bodies. So that is what, what Goodnow meant was that if a policy is established by the elected leaders, by the Congress, then that ends involvement from Congress. Now, is that realistic? That's a question that you have to ask yourself. Um, Goodnow also stressed that people involved in administration should have relatively long tenure. In fact, they should have tenure akin to what judges have which you, some people would say a lifetime tenure, but it's at least a tenure in good behavior, which is what the Constitution says uh, about judges. So what Goodnow was stressing was that expertise in administration um, doesn't come from a person who's in the job for two to four years. Expertise comes from education and experience, and so we should strive to have experts in government who are free from the uh, so-called politicians or the elected leaders. So again, the politics administration dichotomy. Can politics and administration actually be separated? Should they be separated? Or sh are there parts that come together? So um, in public administration in the United States, there were several eras, and this is from a book by Rosenblum. By the way, I reference all these books at the end. Um, what Rosenblum talks about from 1789 to 1829 was a period of elite do elite domination. So uh, basically government was small at the federal level and elites really, some of the same elites that were in government uh, were related to the people who were administering government. Um, uh, federal employment was also considered a, a sinecure or private property and sometimes was informally bequeathed to heirs. It was very small. And this was largely uncontested until the Jacks, the Jackson era. And so the spoil system, which I've been talking about, really was about a 50 year long thing. Um, Andrew Jackson really um, gave it the name, but other presidents did it as well. Um, turnover of positions was thought to be the hallmark of democracy. So incoming presidents spent weeks and months interviewing potential office seekers. There's a great book by uh, this historian Holzer who wrote a book in 2009 called Lincoln President Elect. So at the time, it was six months between the election and the time the president took the oath of office. The election was in November, the president took the oath of office in March. Um, he talks about, in spite of the fact that the states were starting to secede from the union and everybody thought a civil war was going to be possible um, before Lincoln even took office, Lincoln spent the majority of most of his days interviewing people for minor posts and major posts in the federal government. Um, so this was also the beginning at the local level of so-called machine politics, especially in cities and states where uh, because of a, a state and local version really of the spoils system, um, people were given jobs based on the favor of voting certain people into office. So if you voted for Sam Smith for sheriff, um, you know, Sam Smith is going to offer a lot of deputy positions to loyalists. So the, the so-called machine era in politics began during this era as well. The civil service reform era is the environment in which Wilson is writing. So the Pendleton Act sought really to overthrow the spoils system by establishing a merit-based civil service system. And this is important to us in public administration because it is the first time this was done in the United States. States and cities followed suit, but sometimes that took uh, decades really for states and cities to follow suit. Um, and so now we have an expectation that there is a core of employees. So whether that be, uh, you know, a, a civilian employee who works for housing and urban development at the federal level or a school teacher who teaches third grade in Omaha, we have an expectation 
that, that we hire people based on qualification and merit. All that really is a result of the Pendleton Service Civil Service Reform Act of 1883 and the idea that there should be merit and testing to in order to obtain a job. But what we also see in this era is the beginnings of retirement system for government employees. Um, first with military retirements and then with uh, civil service retirements uh, in, in 1920. And so the expectation that working for government meant that you would get a pension actually came of age during this era uh, and, and fully developed to the point where by the time of post-World War II, it, nearly every person who worked for government at any level had the guarantee of some kind of pension. Um, and so during this era is when we start to see this formalization of the politics administration dichotomy. Um, we start to see some names, and we're going to talk about some of these as we go through the course, like uh, Luther Gulick, who's, who really studied how uh, government bureaucracies can be the most efficient possible and still be separated from politics, because we thought that we can manage these public organizations and politics itself is somehow separated from it. So that's something we're going to be, talk about as we go along. We also see a new era that really started with the, the FDR era. Now, this is one that we can really point back to Franklin Roosevelt as kind of starting this era, and that is the extension of the presidency or the growth of the presidency. Um, and this was with, in fact, the concurrence of Congress. So uh, there was something called the Brownlow Committee, which proposed more centralized control of the federal workforce under the president, which led to the creation of this entity we call the Executive Office of the President, which we still have. It led to the creation of the what in the present day we have the Office of Personnel Management and the Office of Management and Budget. And these are both executive offices directly under the president. So all the rules really for federal employees are administered through the Office of Personnel Management. All the money that the federal government spends, really it, the, the Office of Management and Budget has a hand in that. That doesn't mean that Congress doesn't have the power of the purse. Congress does have the power of the purse. Congress actually sets appropriations in ways that they see fit. But the administration of that is effectively done through the executive branch and the OMB. So what we see beginning in really with the during this time and especially World War II. Without World War II, it might not have matured, but we see the growth of the presidency as a much stronger branch of government, which is not, if you read the Federalist Papers, was not really what the founders had in mind, that the, that the executive would be the strongest branch of government. And so you can even think of current events and realize that we still have this argument about the predominance of the legislative or the predominance of the executive. Um, and this really found its start during this era. We also see the start of the so-called welfare state, especially with the implementation of Social Security in 1935. Um, so following this, though, we have this era of heterodoxy. Uh, really, what does that mean? It really means that we're not sure where public administration lies. Um, we we kind of have the demise of the politics administrative dichotomy when we say that um, uh, administrators are involved in politics. We have a lot of people who accuse administrators of being involved in a lot more politics than they probably are. Um, we do have administrative involvement in policy creation, not just policy implementation. Again, with the willing consent of Congress. So for example, when Congress sets the Department of Defense budget, who do they call in to testify? They call in the they call in the Secretary of Defense. They call in the secretaries of the military departments. They call in the top generals and admirals who run the military departments. They ask specifically for presentations from them on how much the Department of Defense should spend and what it's going to spend it on. Um, so it's difficult to say that those administrators don't have a hand in policy. They do have a hand in policy. Uh, it's also difficult to say that Congress 
uh, doesn't want it that way because Congress does want it that way. Um, and then we, we have further professionalism, especially through the innovation of the senior executive service during this period. So this next era is what we call um, the reinventing government and collaborative govern governance eras, really. You know, there's a little bit of disagreement about when this starts, as you're going to see in future readings. But this whole idea of reinventing government was quite popular in the 1990s. And really, uh, we still talk about this, but basically, it's this idea that um, government bureaucracy um, is inefficient in delivering outcomes and so therefore we should uh, we should use private sector mechanisms really to deliver public se sector outcomes later on this this kind of becomes an emphasis on collaboration which is really kind of where we're at right now um, this idea that no one entity in and of itself can deliver the outcomes that it's designed to deliver or that people think it's designed to deliver um, and collaboration becomes necessary um, so this leads really to a blurring of lines between government and sectors for example um, Edward Snowden who's famous um, for giving away some classified information he was often called a, a employee of the National Security Administration he wasn't he was a contractor who worked for Lockheed, um, who was working for the Department of Defense or for the NSA. Um, so the point is, often we see that the work of government, as I showed you on the, the slide by Salomon, is delivered through alternate means. Um, and so we're seeing a blurring of the sectors, really, now in this era. Okay, so let me loop all that back to Wilson and Goodnow. Um, Wilson said that it's getting harder to run a constitution than to frame one, right? Um, Goodnow said, as you'll read, that the administration is akin to the judiciary, meaning that it should be independent of the politics side of things, whatever we define politics as. Uh, and so administration is this separate and distinct branch of government but is it so that really depends on what we mean by politics and what we mean by administration so the question is what really were wilson and goodnow opposing and what were they advocating and uh, what they were talking about does that still hold so for this week um, I promised you this would be a 45 minute lecture. I'm looking at the clock. It's almost an hour. I do apologize. Uh, I want you to read Wilson and Goodnow. I also ask you to keep reading that into next week because uh, it might take a little longer due to the writing style and I recognize that. But these are foundational works. The second thing I really want you to start doing uh, in the syllabus is start thinking about your scholarly book review project, which for that I have a proposal to September 22nd. So please email me in advance questions you have with your thinking on that project. That part's optional, you don't have to do that, but if you want to do that, I encourage you to do so because it's better than to wait for the proposal date. And so for this discussion this week, I'm asking you to dive into the, the Guy and Ellie book. And this is where, as I talked about in the orientation, I start making this connection between, you know, what Guy and Ellie are talking about and Wilson and Goodnow in this case, um, but every week in the case of the more theoretical literature. But um, if you look at page 19 of the book, it talks about eight, uh, it, it presents a brief code of ethics for public administrators. Um, so what I want you to think about is, is how the public administrators of today uphold this code of ethics. And I want you to think about that in the context of what Wilson and Goodnow are writing about. How do the implementers of public policy uh, exercise their code of ethics for public administration? And so what? how do the, the kinds of public servants that we saw, for example, in the video series, how do they uphold these kinds of ethics? So that's the connection I'm asking you to make for this week.
you know, for next week, I'm going to get more into Goodnow and Wilson themselves and talk about them directly. So every week in the in the lecture, I try to provide uh, the references. So this week's no no exception. So here are the references. And with that, then I conclude this lecture and I look forward to your discussions. Thank you.